Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Emma Loizo and I'm a junior barrister at Radcliffe Chambers. Today we're going to be discussing the recent Court of Appeal case brought by Travellers Insurance Company Limited. Now the Court of Appeal confirmed that where an insured and insurer had jointly retained solicitors and the insured had subsequently assigned its professional negligence claim against those solicitors to another, the assignee as the insured successor in title was entitled to disclosure of the files covered by the joint retainer. The insurer could not prevent disclosure of those documents. Now, this is a significant decision um, on legal professional privilege, and it's likely to be of general importance to all legal practitioners, uh, but insurers in particular should take note. So I'm joined by Christopher Boardman QC, a commercial Hello. barrister at Radcliffe Chambers, who represented the insured's administrators and the first respondent to the appeal. Now, Chris, there seems to have been quite a bit of litigation history to the case. At the beginning of the judgment, Lord Justice Colson suggested that the issue before the court had become caught up in a certain amount of factual complexity and a good deal of suspicion and bitterness between the parties. So perhaps you could start by telling the viewers a bit about the background to the case and who were the other parties. Sure. So the background to the case begins with the uh, PIP claim by about 700 women. Uh, against uh, Transform and other defendants. Uh, and that was in respect of Transform's supply to those women and many thousands others of um, uh, uh, breast implants manufactured by the now infamous company PIP of France. So they brought that claim and uh, Transform was insured in respect of some of those claims by Travelers Insurance Company. Um, um, now the company did not you know, disclosed to the claimants that it was only insured in respect of a relatively small proportion of the claims. A judge later held that if they had known that uh, Transform was only insured in respect of some of the claims, then those who were not insured might well not have brought the claims and, or indeed uh, certainly would have settled them. So this was significant information that was not disclosed to them. And um, uh, when it was eventually agreed by travellers that they, they could be told that they were, they were not insured, um, the company was by that point insolvent and it quickly went into administration. The administrators sold the business and they were looking to see what assets they could uh, uh, recover for the benefit of creditors. And one of the, the assets was a claim against the solicitors, BLM, who'd acted for them and travellers, uh, and also uh, a claim against counsel, basically for their advice to not disclose that they were only insured for a small number until quite late on in the proceedings. Effectively, that if they had uh, disclosed this earlier, then they wouldn't have incurred um, a lot of the costs that were involved in the proceedings, and indeed many of the claims that resulted in judgments uh, would not have arisen at all. So what they were looking to do was to try and find a way to uh, bring that claim, but they didn't have any money to do it. So by a, a, a str somewhat strange twist of fate, what they did was they sold the claims or the right to bring those claims by way of an assignment to a company or an LLP that was an associate of the claimant's solicitors, the PIP claimant solicitors. So um, uh, although they were not able to recover anything in the PIP claims because Transform was insolvent, uh, in that way they sought to try and make a recovery for, uh, against the solicitors and counsel who'd acted for Transform in the proceedings. And so this was the, the appeal before the Court of Appeal. So what, what happened at, at first instance? Well, at uh, first instance, what happened was the uh, administrators um, asked BLM to disclose their files. Uh, that is to say the files that related to the PIP litigation. Um, BLM uh, appreciated that what the, the administrators wanted them for, amongst other things, was to bring a claim against BLM themselves and counsel. So they were somewhat reluctant, as you might imagine, to disclose that. But in any event, um, uh, after some delay, an application was issued by the administrators to force uh, BLM to disclose the files. And when that happened, travellers um, decided that they would oppose the application. Uh, BLM were nominally uh, neutral on the matter. And so it was travellers that was uh, taking the lead in this, and they really opposed the application on two grounds. First of all, they said, look, um, this is our privilege. Uh, you cannot use your statutory powers under the Insolvency Act to recover privileged documents, so therefore your application fails. That was their first argument. And that argument failed essentially because um, it, it didn't take into account the fact that they were not the only party instructing 
BLM. Uh, Transform was also instructing BLM. And Transform, and um, after its uh, administration, its administrators were entitled to see the documents. And so that, that, um, that was issue one that failed. The second issue that they raised um, was a concern in relation to who was actually going to see them, namely this specific LLP that was set up um, and was associated with Hugh James, the firm of solicitors acting for the claimants. And what they were arguing was that Hugh James and therefore this specific um, LLP had a conflict of interest uh, and they would be obliged to disclose um, documents to the PIP claimants. And in that way, their privilege, as they described it, would be undermined. And that argument also failed. Um, the judge didn't accept uh, that uh, there was a conflict of interest that would require uh, Hugh James to disclose to uh, uh, the, uh, the PIP claimants. And he accepted undertakings from the administrators and from Hugh James that would ensure that the, um, the privilege was, was properly preserved. And previous authorities have, have dealt with the position of a successor in title and legal professional privilege. Uh, and Lord Justice Colson, in his judgment, helpfully summarised some of the most significant decisions. Um, but what, what were the particular issues in, in the appeal? Well, um, so the appeal was only on the first of the grounds that I identified before. Um, Lord Justice Coulson did indeed go through some of the authorities on what's called the successor in title principle after a well-known case called Crescent Farm, sometimes also called the Crescent Farm principle. Um, but but um, most of those authorities were dealing with sole retainer cases or cases where the privilege was um, only that of a single person, namely the assign or, or seller of an asset. And so the circumstances are quite, you know, on one uh, argument, quite different because if, if a person sells an asset um, and it's his privilege, uh, then it's reasonable to assume that he's selling the benefit of the privilege, or if you like, or it goes with the assignment of the asset or the sale of the asset to the, the purchaser or assignee in this case. But this is quite different because this is um, where there, you're affecting a different party, a jo somebody who's jointly entitled to the privilege. And as uh, was the case here with uh, travellers, they were not at all happy that documents over which they had joint privilege would be disclosed and disseminated in the way that the administrators were seeking to do. So um, uh, the issue in this case was whether or not uh, the Crescent Farm principle that had been established in relation to sole retainers could be extended or was to be applied in a joint retainer case. There was a case um, earlier on called Konigsberg, which was a, a bankruptcy case uh, in which there was a joint retainer of solicitors and the court held that um, the successor entitled principle applied there. But the problem with that, so far as the administrators were concerned, is that it had been overruled in another court of appeal case called Schlossberg. Um, and so therefore the, the question arose as to whether or not the administrators could rely on that and indeed other cases um, that were cited to the court and that are set out in Lord Justice Coulson's judgment to, if you like, extend or apply that principle to joint retainers. And the appellant relied on the 2006 case of, of Winterthur Swiss Insurance Company uh, in support of, of its argument. And, and Lord Justice Coulson stated that Winterthur had been cited as authority for the proposition that an assignee was in the same position as a successor in title in relation to legal privilege, and also that where access rights had been given contractually to insurers, they were not in the nature of rights that were capable of assignment. So what was the relevance of, of Winterthur to the, to the appellant's argument? Well, the irony is Winterthur was an authority that I had cited below uh, to the judge to show that the successor in title principle applied where there was an assignment of a shows in action, because in that case, like in our case, um, it involved um, an assignment of a cause of action against a firm of solicitors that had acted in litigation. And what was, um, what was desired by the assignee was access to the, the documents, you know, the solicitor files. So there, you know, there was a factual similarity. However, the, 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 that was in a sole retainer case. That's important. And what um, the appellant travellers sought to do was to extend that to a joint retainer by arguing that in fact Winterthur had held that um, joint retainers, um, the principle of successor title didn't apply to joint retainers. Uh, 
I, I won't go into the detail of that argument because it's quite in depth on, on the judgment. But, but uh, in short, um, the argument on the appeal and the sole ground of appeal and the notice of appeal, although they ended up arguing three points in the Court of Appeal rather than just the one, but the sole ground of appeal was that um, the judge got it wrong because he failed to apply Winterthur by which he was bound to the facts of the case. And the Court of Appeal agreed with um, um, the administrator's submissions that in fact Winterthur didn't apply, that Winterthur didn't require um, the finding that they held that it required, and that uh, in, in those cases of Konigsberg and others uh, did hold that the successor entitled principle applied to joint retainers. Thanks, Chris. Um... So Lord Justice Colson suggested at the start that the answer to the question before the court um, appeared to be plainly in favour of disclosure to the insured successor. I mean, you told us a bit about what the, the Court of Appeal um, decided. Um, uh, but given the judge's remarks at the outset, was that decision predictable? Well, it's easy to be wise after the event, as they say. <laughs> if it was so predictable, then perhaps uh, they wouldn't have obtained permission to appeal <laughs> and uh, they wouldn't have argued over three years and spent hundreds of thousands of pounds in the process trying to um, uh, make a point. I don't think it could be described as predictable, particularly because the issue of privilege is one of public policy uh, and the extent of that policy is always... Uh, the subject of argument and there are conflicting principles that go the other way. I mean, here, travellers' um, argument was really quite stark. What they were saying was, it is outrageous that I have instructed a firm of solicitors jointly with an insured, and the, do the, 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 the documents that uh, are privileged in the litigation are going to be disclosed and the effect of that disclosure is that the, the people against whom I'm in litigation are going to discover the information. And so that was the sort of stark uh, conflict in terms of the facts. And, and it was that that was driving the arguments from Travis' point of view. And I, I understand permission to appeal was obtained on the basis of the general importance and wide application of this decision. And um, perhaps you could talk to us a bit about what you consider are the main implications of this case. Yes, travellers very much put their argument on the basis that if we were right, the administrators were right, then that would be a very surprising outcome and would have uh, dramatic consequences for the insurance industry. Now, that might have been slightly overstating the position, but certainly the impact of the decision um, is there. And it's there not only on insurers who now have to realise that if they're going to try and obtain the benefit of, as it were, getting a joint instruction of solicitors, which obviously gives them access to um, privileged material which they might otherwise not, and gives them close involvement with litigation um, which, which is related to their insurance. If they're going to get that benefit, then it also comes with burdens or risks, uh, and one of them is uh, the one that's been established in this case. So that's certainly something that uh, insurers are going to take note of. Uh, but I think that um, you know, it has wider implications as well. Solicitors and counsel who acted in that case, so BLM uh, were, the, were the firm, um, you know, they will also have to take note that if they're going to act for an insurer and an insured, they really do have to make, uh, take care to ensure that, uh, that there's no conflict between the advice that they're giving to uh, the insurer and the advice that they're giving to the insured. That's certainly something. And, and the outcome in terms of what happens to the documents, all these documents are now being disclosed to the assignee and possibly used in the litigation um, against them, as it were. So subject again to the question of privilege and whether that's possible. There are, there are still issues there in, in, in relation to that litigation. And then finally, uh, I, would so, I would say that insolvency practitioners would also want to take note of this decision because um, it affects their ability to realize assets um, in a liquidation of a company uh, or administration of the company, you know, assets that perhaps were, could not have been realized, such as claims of this kind, can now be um, assigned effectively, has been established, to perhaps the other side of the litigation. And then that person will be able to actually uh, obtain access to the information and documentation, which is so critical to, to be able to, to run the claim against the solicitors and counsel. Thanks very much. Well, those are all my questions. Thanks everyone for watching. Thank you, everyone. I hope you found it interesting.